Today we begin our study of Plato and of Plato's Socrates. Because we're interested in becoming the students of, of Plato and his Socrates, we'll begin by looking at the way Plato presents Socrates as a teacher of students, actual or, or potential. Now, there are many dialogues that, that treat the theme of Socrates as teacher. I suppose you could say that, in a sense, all the dialogues do that. So, of course, we have to choose from among them. And I propose that we begin with the dialogue called Alcibiades I. Now, it's a relatively short dialogue, and so it's, it's easier of access than, than some. And there is a tradition dating back at least to the 3rd century A.D., according to which the Alcibiades I is the first dialogue that ought to be studied. The Alcibiades I introduces the relationship between Socrates and Alcibiades that Plato evidently thought was very important. Why? Because Plato presents Socrates and Alcibiades together in a total of four dialogues. And those dialogues chronicle the beginning, the middle, and the end of their time together. No other person, apart from Socrates himself, of course, appears as frequently in the dialogues. Now, the four dialogues in which Alcibiades appears are the Alcibiades I, the shorter Alcibiades II, its companion, the Protagoras, and finally, and most famously, the Symposium. There, Alcibiades gives a very frank speech, after too much wine, about his relationship with Socrates. Now, I propose to do three main things today. First, I'd like to give a brief biographical sketch of Alcibiades. Who was this fellow? Then, I want to discuss the Alcibiades I. And finally, I want to treat the other three Platonic dialogues that deal with Alcibiades. But we'll pay particular attention to Alcibiades' famous speech in the Symposium. So, who then, who then was this Alcibiades fellow? He was, quite simply, I think, one of the most astonishing figures in all antiquity. I choose the word carefully, astonishing, for reasons that I think you'll see. He lived from uh, about 450 to 404 BC. He was an Athenian, born and raised. His father was Clinius, and he was killed in battle when Alcibiades was, was quite young. And so Alcibiades went to live with his uncle, who happened to be none other than the greatest democratic statesman in Athens, Pericles. Alcibiades was remarkably handsome. He was rich. His family was one of the most distinguished in Greece. In short, Alcibiades seemed to have the world by the tail. Alcibiades also had a staggeringly quick rise to power in Athens. In the course of the Peloponnesian War against Sparta and her allies, and while he was really still quite young, Alcibiades managed to get himself elected as one of Athens' generals. And, not only that, he managed to convince the Athenian democracy to undertake a kind of mind-bogglingly ambitious plan to conquer the very distant island of Sicily. Now, as, as the historian Thucydides tells us, Alcibiades lived his private life in a very extravagant way. For example, he single-handedly entered seven horses in the Olympic chariot races, placing first, second, and fourth. This was a, a very splashy thing to do if you own two or three of the teams vying for the, the Super Bowl eventually, uh, something like that. And this extravagance on Alcibiades' part led the people, the masses in general, most of whom would be poor, to be deeply suspicious of him. What exactly is this guy going to do? What exactly is he aiming at? Now, it so happened that on the eve of Athens setting sail with a vast armada to conquer Sicily, which was again Alcibiades' plan, some young men happened to mutilate certain religious statues, what was taken to be a very bad omen by the masses. And Alcibiades' political enemies, he had, of course, political enemies, it shouldn't surprise us, they managed to link his name with these religious desecrations. And so not long after Alcibiades set sail for Sicily, the people of Athens recalled him to stand trial for religious desecration. And again, it shouldn't surprise us 
that he said, no, I don't think I will go back. And so began his rather astonishing political ride. Alcibiades went first to Sparta, that is, Athens' greatest enemy. And he aided Sparta in ways that did real damage to, to Athens. When he wore out his welcome in Sparta, Alcibiades went to the third great power in the area, namely Persia, which was the traditional enemy of all Greeks alike. And there he sought to wield as much influence as he could. In short, Alcibiades managed to fight on three different sides in the same war. And even more amazing than that, he eventually succeeded in having himself recalled to Athens after all that he had done against his city. Now, although he did manage to, to lead the Athenian war effort for a time after his recall, and to lead it well, he eventually fell afoul again of Athens and sought refuge in a place called Phrygia. There, some Persian agents, probably acting on a Spartan directive, assassinated Alcibiades in 404 BC. It's said, by the way, that Alcibiades had seduced the wife of the Spartan king while he was in Sparta. So if that's true, the Spartans had reason to want him dead. He would have been about 45 years old. Still, though, Thucydides' portrait of Alcibiades is, on the whole, favorable or sympathetic. At any rate, Thucydides says that Alcibiades' conduct of the war was second to none, and that he could be blamed only for the conduct of his private life, which provoked the, the envy or the resentment of the people which are obviously the bedrock of the democracy. So whatever we might have to think of Alcibiades, colorful, talented, treacherous, complicated, surely, it is an odd thing for Plato to choose to shine a spotlight on him as a student of Socrates. In fact, their association in Alcibiades' youth got Socrates into some hot water. Uh, in Xenophon's chapter of the Memorabilia, meant to clear Socrates of the charge of corrupting the young, uh, Xenophon is forced to explain, or explain away, their connection. And Xenophon there argues, by the way, that Alcibiades was moderate or, or self-controlled for so long as he was with Socrates, and that he became so extravagant only once he broke with Socrates. So, with this much as a kind of preface, let's turn now to look at Plato's presentation of the beginning of the association between Alcibiades and Socrates, as Plato records it in the Alcibiades I. The Alcibiades I takes place on the eve of Alcibiades' planned entrance into Athenian democratic politics. Young as he is, he thinks he's ready to lead the city. Now, we learn immediately that, that Socrates has been watching Alcibiades for quite a long time. But he's chosen this moment to speak to him for the first time. Now Alcibiades supposes, and Socrates at first uh, gives him reason to suppose, that Socrates is just another fellow courting the handsome young man in the ancient Greek manner. Socrates presents himself as a would-be lover of Alcibiades, who has for some reason never approached him before, and who persists in his interest in Alcibiades even long after the other suitors have, have turned their attention elsewhere. Now, maybe I should say, just for the record, that Socrates' interests in Alcibiades do prove to be entirely of the soul rather than of the body. Uh, and this Alcibiades himself will make only too clear in his symposium speech, which we'll look at a little later. But the action, or the, the drama of the Alcibiades one, includes an, an amazing transformation, you could call it. Because at the beginning of the dialogue, the poor, rather obscure Socrates presents himself as a lover, courting the handsome and sought-after Alcibiades, who is, let's say, at best indifferent to Socrates at the beginning. By the end of the dialogue, though, this is what Alcibiades says. Quote, I want to say the following, that we will probably be changing roles, Socrates, I taking yours and you mine. For from this day, nothing can keep me from attending on you and you from being attended on by me. So we have to ask, 
How does this obscure fellow Socrates succeed in making of Alcibiades, not the pursued, but the pursuer, eager to spend time with Socrates above all others? It is, as I say, an amazing transformation. Well, Socrates begins wooing Alcibiades, if, if that's the right expression, in a time-honored way. He flatters him. He lists all of Alcibiades' very many advantages in life, both natural and conventional. But Socrates adds, If I thought you were satisfied with these, I would never have approached you. For Alcibiades, it turns out, wants something more out of life, even than what he has. Socrates goes so far as to say that if Alcibiades had to choose between remaining content with what he is and what he has, or dying, Alcibiades would choose to die. So what then does Alcibiades long for? Socrates takes a guess. It's this. To hold sway not only in Athens, but in all of Greece. And not only in Greece, but in all Europe. And not only there, but in Asia too. Alcibiades, Socrates guesses, wants to rule the world. And Alcibiades, in effect, confirms this statement because he doesn't deny it. Now, the very statement of this staggering ambition, the young kid who literally wants to rule the world, would seem to put Socrates and Alcibiades farther apart. And yet Socrates here states a whopper. He says, it's not possible for all these things you have in mind to be brought to completion without me. You want to rule the world, in effect, Socrates says, come see me first. Socrates first presents himself then as the key needed to realize Alcibiades' grand ambitions, which Socrates has just stated with an amazing prescience. Alcibiades now is intrigued by this strange fellow. All right, tell me a little more, Socrates, he says. What follows is a kind of classic example of Socratic dialectic or, or conversational scrutiny. Socrates seeks to discover what it is that Alcibiades thinks he knows such that he can now skillfully guide Athenian public affairs. But Alcibiades has a hard time coming up with the specific expertise that he has that the Athenian city or, or polis needs. Eventually he says, well, I think I can best advise the city when they're deliberating about war and peace. When and how it's better to wage war and when not. All right, Socrates says, but what knowledge exactly would permit you to give such important advice? Alcibiades says, eventually, after much fumbling around, well, I think it would be not my knowledge of justice. That it takes Alcibiades so long to come to this answer is important. And when he elaborates on it, he's surprisingly coy. Consider this exchange. Quote, Socrates, whom will you advise the Athenians to wage war against? Those behaving unjustly or those practicing the just things? Alcibiades, what you're asking is a terrible thing. For even if someone had it in his mind that war ought to be waged against those practicing the just things, he would not admit it, at least. In other words, Alcibiades is somewhat reluctant to say that he would consider most seriously the justice or injustice of a war when he's advising Athens. It takes him a while even to arrive at this thought. And he mentions the case of somebody who has it in mind to attack the just, the innocent in other words, but who of course would never admit this. Not to put too fine a point on it, Alcibiades is perfectly willing to wage an unjust war, if he privately thinks that that would be better for Athens. Now, the reason why Alcibiades is willing to say goodbye to justice is brought out very clearly in the next part of their conversation. Alcibiades doesn't believe that justice, or in fact any of the moral virtues, is simply or consistently good. Following the just course would sometimes require the sacrifice of the good or the advantage of the city. And so I, as a tough-minded politician, I'll advise the city to go to war anyway, whether it's a just or unjust war. And he says, very matter-of-factly, 
Many have profited from committing great injustices. There's just one problem, at least, with this tough-minded position, it turns out. Alcibiades cannot bring himself to stick to it consistently. Alcibiades proves to be deeply confused about the goodness of justice and of the moral virtues more generally. Now, this confusion will return in, in one form or another in other dialogues. So I do want now to try to flesh it out a little bit, though we'll, we'll have the chance to return to it later on as well. Socrates brings out Alcibiades' confusion by speaking of courage first rather than justice. Courage, Alcibiades agrees, is sometimes very bad for you. Sometimes helping your comrades in battle can lead to your being wounded or, or even killed. But would you, Alcibiades, choose to be a coward in those cases and to fail to aid your comrades? Or would you choose to be wounded or, or even to die in the service of courage? Alcibiades answers without hesitation, I would rather die than be a, courage, than be a coward. Period. So he thinks that courage is good and bad for him. I'd rather live than die, because living is a very great good, death a very great evil, but I'd rather die courageously than live as a coward. Now the notion linking the strange goodness or badness of courage is this Greek term tokalon, what is noble or admirable or beautiful. Alcibiades' opinion is roughly this. To fight courageously in battle is often bad for you, sure, but it is noble. And yet I would always choose to do the noble rather than the shameful thing. Why? Because it's always better to act nobly than shamefully, at least in the long run. To act nobly is good for the person who does so. Hence, to die courageously is noble and therefore good, at least in the long run. To repeat, Alcibiades thinks that courage is definitely uh, uh, bad in the sense of disadvantageous and definitely good in the sense of advantageous because it's a noble thing to do. Alcibiades is of two minds, then, about courage. Now, when Socrates turns to apply this very reasoning to the case of justice, Alcibiades has to drop his earlier line of argument. He thinks it would clearly be noble or admirable to wage only just wars. Unjust wars are, of course, ignoble or shameful. But if, as the case of courage has suggested, what is noble is also always good, and what is shameful is always bad, then just wars have to always be good, unjust wars would always be bad. In this way, Socrates gets Alcibiades to retract his earlier view that acting justly could sometimes be bad or that, or that acting unjustly could sometimes be good. Now, I want to stress that Socrates has not proved the truth of these propositions. He hasn't proved, for example, that justice is in fact always good because it's noble. But what he has proved, beyond any doubt, is that Alcibiades is deeply confused about justice. He thinks it's both good and bad. Alcibiades has proved to be a rather easygoing fellow in his thought, ready to abandon justice without ever having given it serious thought, and he's about to enter politics. Alcibiades, you could say, has blinded himself to his deep attachment to justice. He's not as sophisticated as he thinks he is. And this confusion Socrates has brought, up, brought him to see. He says, by the God, Socrates, I myself don't know what I'm saying. And I seem like somebody in an altogether strange condition. For at one time things seem a certain way as you question me, but at another time, another. The dialogue concludes with some very beautiful remarks about the need to take care of oneself or to know thyself. The very famous saying associated with the Delphic Oracle, and that is often quoted by Socrates as a kind of motto. The case of Alcibiades, who's extraordinarily gifted in so many ways, shows how difficult true self-knowledge is. We first have to see our confusion, then attempt somehow to cure it. The Platonic dialogues have no other purpose, so to speak, than to help us achieve this twofold task. Now I want to turn uh, in the final part of my lecture today, to sketch the rest of Socrates' attempted education of Alcibiades as Plato presents it. The next chapter of the story is found in the Alcibiades II. This very brief dialogue begins with Socrates coming across Alcibiades as Alcibiades is about to go off to pray, for what we never exactly learn. And though each of them is clearly still well disposed toward the other, 
They're not together when the dialogue opens. They meet by chance. Now, if we take a, a bird's eye view of the action of the dialogue, it consists simply in this. Socrates converses with young Alcibiades with the result that the latter abandons his plan to go and pray. Now, this is striking, I think. Socrates succeeds in proving to Alcibiades that he should pray only when he knows with certainty what to pray for. And that is, once he knows what would truly be good for him. That Socrates is able to shake Alcibiades' confidence in this respect is impressive, since, as, as we saw already in the first Alcibiades, he's extraordinarily ambitious. And that means he's certain that having great political power would be the single greatest good for anybody, and also for him, himself then. But in fact, the truest object of Alcibiades' great ambition isn't clear, least of all to him. Sure, he wants to rule the world, but for the sake of what exactly? And Socrates points out this, this lack of clarity to him in a blunt, but there's also a very clear way. Socrates asks, would you be willing to kill your mother in order to attain the great good you seek? Alcibiades is shocked at the very suggestion. Of course I wouldn't. But this means that there is something else, something other, a greater good than even ruling the world that Alcibiades cares about more. And that something else we could call justice or, or morality. There are times then when Alcibiades would prefer to sacrifice the thing that he thinks is the greatest good of all, grand rule. Not only is this fact somewhat unclear to him, but the character of the thing that he cares for more, justice, also remains kind of fuzzy to him. And Socrates stresses that unless we confront and, and grapple with our sometimes hidden attachment to justice, above all to the hopes that justice gives rise to, to in us, we'll never possess self-knowledge. We have to conclude, I think, at the, at the end of the first two dialogues dealing with Alcibiades, that gifted though he certainly is, he may not be a promising Socratic. Now, I won't say much about the Protagoras, uh, the third dialogue in which Alcibiades appears, and that's simply because we'll discuss it at some length later on. Uh, for now, I just note that Alcibiades is there eagerly seeking out the company of a group of visiting sophists. And this suggests, at least, that Alcibiades' hopes for help from Socrates may be beginning to dim. Now, the last we hear of Alcibiades in Plato is his drunken speech in the Symposium, which I've alluded to. It is a justly famous speech, I think. Toward the end of that great dialogue, after most have offered speeches in praise of Eros, that is to say, of, of the god love, Alcibiades bursts in, drunk, with a band of fellow partiers. And there's such a commotion that follows that he manages to sit down beside Socrates without, at first at least, seeing him. And he's, he's startled to see that Socrates is there. And then Alcibiades launches into a speech that, in, in its own way, is quite moving. It contains very, very high praise of Socrates, together with some, some pretty tough criticism of him. He even says that he sometimes wishes Socrates were dead. But that criticism takes more the form of an expression of Alcibiades' own dashed hopes, I think, for his association with Socrates. And it does include some harsh criticism of himself, including, I think, a dollop of, of shame or, or, or self-loathing. Simply put, he thought that spending time with Socrates, and only Socrates, was the key to his becoming a serious human being, and yet he found that time endlessly frustrating. And I think by, by implication, he has failed in his own eyes to become the serious human being that he wanted to become. Still, though, the core of Alcibiades' speech here is his claim to have seen through Socrates, to have seen Socrates as he is truly, and not just merely in appearance. And he famously compares Socrates here to certain hollowed-out statues of Silenus, a, a flute-playing satyr, half man, half horse. And these statues are ugly on the outside, but when you open them up, 
they reveal beautiful statues of gods. In fact, Alcibiades compares both Socrates as a whole and his speeches to these little statues, ugly on the outside, beautiful on the inside. And Alcibiades describes first the effect that Socrates' speeches have on everybody, man, woman, child, anybody who hears them. They are swept away by them. They're deeply moved, they're inspired or possessed by them, he says. In fact, this is the effect they still, even now, have on Alcibiades, he says. And yet, this uh, must be the outer part of the speech only, what's accessible to everybody, which is ugly in comparison with the, the inner part of the speech. And in this connection, he says some provocative things, Alcibiades does. For example, that though Socrates claimed to be head over heels in love with, with beautiful people, he was in fact indifferent to them. That Socrates was continually ironic toward people. There's that word again, irony. In short, Alcibiades implies very few people really know what Socrates is about, but I do. And this, of course, makes us eager to hear from Alcibiades the truth about the, the inner Socrates, if you will. In fact, I think the whole of Alcibiades' understanding of Socrates rests on his understanding of the true or the inner meaning of Socrates' speeches. Now, what impressed Alcibiades most, at least what he spends most time discussing here, was Socrates' moderation, which Alcibiades interprets, at least, as Socrates' massive indifference, you could say, to physical beauty, to wealth, honor, on the one hand, and on the other to things like discomfort or hunger, cold, and so on. It's in the context of proving Socrates' astounding moderation that Alcibiades tells us of Socrates' behavior in battle. He was drafted. Socrates was, was tougher than the other soldiers. He endured hardships without a murmur or complaint. He saved not only his own life in battle, but, but Alcibiades' too, it turns out. And Socrates kept his head, even in retreat, which is the most dangerous part of battle. It's in this context that Alcibiades also tells us, with a kind of wince-inducing candor, of his attempt to seduce Socrates after he'd fallen in love with him. Now, the details of that seduction you can read on your own, but let it suffice to say that the, the handsomest, one of the richest men in Athens, threw himself at Socrates, and Socrates behaved strictly like a father or older brother to Alcibiades much to Alcibiades' disappointment and annoyance. Now, this capacity of Socrates is impressive, his moderation. It's exactly the same quality that, that Xenophon, too, points to in, in what he calls continence, as we've seen. But we have to ask, for the sake of what was this self-restraint exercised? It surely can't be for its own sake. And it's with this question in mind that we turn to Alcibiades' account of Socrates' so-called inner speeches his true arguments, as opposed to his ironic ones, which, which are available to everybody. And it's to, it is to just this question that Alcibiades returns at the end of his speech. Inside the speeches are the only arguments that make sense, Alcibiades says, that are the most divine statues of virtue, the ones that anybody who's going to be noble and good has to examine. That's all Alcibiades says, period. But I think a moment's reflection shows that Alcibiades thinks the inner speeches about virtue are essentially the same as the deeply moving speeches that are accessible to everybody. In other words, I think, Plato shows, Alcibiades has failed to see beyond the outer and deeply moving speeches, exhorting people to care for virtue, to the examination of virtue itself, and so on. Because this is exactly how he describes the supposedly inner speeches. But this is only to confirm, I think, that Alcibiades failed to see the puzzle that Socrates pointed him toward, namely, his confused understanding of the goodness of virtue and what it is that Alcibiades most wants in life and from life. This merely confirms that Alcibiades was no Socratic, and it explains how he could go on to have the political career that he did, one marked by, by, cert, by many things, I suppose, but certainly not by either moderation or justice. Now, in the next lecture, we turn to this very topic, Socrates as a teacher of justice.